here's what James says. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism or partiality. You recall from last time that that opens with a, a present imperative in the Greek language. That's a standing command with a second person plural. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal partiality or personal favoritism. And the idea is we must not be a respecter of person. Then he gives an illustration of it out of uh, the first century. Uh, a Jewish illustration, uh, when it says the assembly, uh, that's the word for synagogue, and that would have been very prevalent for James, even though he was a pastor of the Jerusalem Christian church. For if a man comes into your assembly, that's the way he would have thought. An assembly, he would have thought more Jewish than he would have Christian because the assembly is later, the word for assembly later, we're, this is the first writing under the new covenant that's come out. Later, the word for assembly will be ec ecclesia, and that's the church. And so what, what James calls the assembly in the transitional period from the old covenant to the new covenant, from the Jewish age to the church age, the assembly was the, was the word when people assembled. They assembled, and that's where the word synagogue comes from. So now he gives an illustration, and what is interesting about this illustration, pay attention to this, is that uh, the, the people who were welcoming visitors, the ushers who welcomed the visitors and seated them, you pay attention to this, these people. Uh, pay attention to them on, this, on partiality, showing respect for persons which they're not supposed to do. Pay attention to that now. If a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring dressed in fine clothes, He's called the wealthy man. And there also comes in to your assembly, these are visitors, a poor man in dirty clothes. You got the picture? We got visitors, and they're going to be seated by the ushers of the assembly. And you pay special attention to the one who is wearing fine clothes and say to that visitor, sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over here or sit down under my feet, the footstool. Okay? Then he makes a point in verse 4. Have you not made distinctions? Have you not discriminated is the word. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil motive. You know what the answer to that is? Well, you apparently missed two studies. Because there are four rhetorical questions. They have a question mark after them. They're rhetorical. And they're rhetorical with uke, O-U-C-H. And when you have uke with, with this, with a rhetorical, it, the answer is yes every time. From verse 4 to verse 7, there are four rhetorical questions that you, that open book test that you should get 100 at. <laughs> right? I mean, he tells you ahead of time. He said, I'm going to give you a test. I'm going to give you four questions. The answer to all of them is yes. <laughs> Can we get 100? Well, I don't know. So verse 4, <laughs> notice the question mark. That's a rhetorical with uke. Have you not discriminated among yourself and become judges with evil motive? What's the answer? Okay. See, I want you all to get 100. <laughs> Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? What's the answer? Yes. yes. But, verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. How did they do that? Partiality, the sin of partiality. 
you have dishonored the poor man. That's a statement. Right? Now he comes to the question. So he pauses between the four rhetorical questions to make a statement to you, a doctrinal statement. Now he comes to the question. Is not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Boy, was that going on big time. In fact, it's going to go on. This is in the this in the 45 when this book come out. 62, this group of people, do not, do not the rich drag you into court? That group of people is going to murder James politically. By that, I mean they're going to trump up charges, run him through uh, an, uh, a faulty government court system, and they're going to kill him. Is not the rich... Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? What's the answer? Oh, you're so good. Here's the final one. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by what you have been called? What's the fair name? God. Christ. Did they do it to, did they do it to Christ? Are they doing it to the followers of Christ? When they do it to you, will you understand something really important? Huh? that you're in good company. That's, that's called undeserved suffering. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? The answer? See? James has really helped us out. But what here? what's the problem? They have been doing that. The ushers have been cooperating with the enemy. Haven't they? Let me have a word of prayer. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. How do you recover? What's the problem-solving device? Confession of personal sin, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, restore us to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is the key for not only learning the Bible, but for applying it in our life. So, Father, we thank you today for these that come our way by automobile and by Internet to study with us the book of James. Here we are in the second chapter looking at the concept of be no respecter of persons. Treat everybody identically. All are, in, all are in need of the gospel salvation by grace through faith and not of himself, a gift of God. Or they're Christians. And we not, need to not be a respecter of person in regard to them. We need to learn a principle from God who is no respecter of persons, how we do that. How do we do that in a culture that is full of prejudice and bias, full of respecter of persons? We have to put on the new man, divine viewpoint thinking. We have to embrace a... a divine viewpoint principle rather than the principle of the world, the way the world thinks or the way other churches think. We need to think the way the Lord Jesus Christ would have us think, what the word of God says to us. And if we're the only person that does it and the rest of the world persecutes us for it, so be it. Amen. All right. Here's what he says. I put this again on your paper. My brethren, do not hold, that's a negative may with echo, present, active, imperative, just as a reminder to you. Stop doing this or don't do this anymore. Stop, don't. Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude, that's a mental attitude sin, 
with the attitude of personal favoritism, partiality, a mental attitude sin. Partiality can be manifested in different ways. It can be by bias or prejudice. There are a lot of different ways of looking at this. But it's a mental attitude sin. What is interesting me is I got, I got ushers, and all the ushers in this uh, d discussion, in our story, all the ushers that are ushering in people are of the same mindset. They're a respecter of persons. When a person comes in, they've been instructed, if he's, if he's wealthy, educated, yada, yada, a Jew, you set him over here. If he's not, then any old place will do. And if you can't find anything, put him on the floor, but don't put him in the good seats. They all were doing it. Instructional business. And James comes out and really attacks that. So you had two different kinds of partiality going on. A respecter of persons and no respecter of persons. Right? And they were both sinful. Because you're not to be a respecter of any person. Do you see the problem they had? Okay, well, it's important you look at this, the, the text. It's important you, you look at the whole thing and get an idea of what was really going on. You know, don't, so you don't have to read into what you think might be going on. Just read out what is actually going on, and you'll be ahead of the game. So, in our lesson text, uh, it is used with a negative command, and they were being respectful of persons on a negative side in both areas. They were respecting some people they shouldn't respect, agreed? Be no, be no respecter of persons. So in comes somebody, you show respect to him. Somebody comes you don't respect, you don't show respect. You're not show, supposed to show respect for any of them. You're supposed to treat them all the same way. And that's our lesson today. The first lesson is be no respecter of persons. And let me tell you, every culture out of every generation has had to face this issue. So this is, this is nothing new, and probably you would taught your life not to do this. I was taught that way by a family who were not believers that didn't study the Bible, not to do this. I was really fortunate to grow up in a culture like that. In our, lesson, in our first lesson, we're going to study three aspects of be no respecter of persons. It was one of the ancient customs, this word in the Greek language for partiality is a compound word in a moment you will see. And when you met in the ancient culture, when you met somebody, when you greeted somebody, they didn't look you in the eye. The two things they didn't do that we do as an American culture, they didn't look you in the eye and give you a, a strong handshake. We're taught to do that, aren't we? My, my parents, the only people who taught me that. You step up, you look them in the eye, you tell them who you are, ask them who they are, and give them a good strong handshake. Not in the ancient world. In the ancient world, when somebody approached you, he did not look you in the eye until he had permission. It's, and it was called, when a person came forward with you, you lifted his face or you, you told him to lift, that he had permission to look. They didn't do that. There are a lot of, a lot of parts of the nation, they still don't do that. Have you been there? Well, you've seen movies. And this is where this idea comes from, be no respecter of person. The Greek word really is interesting. What we find as a principle that's very strong 
is God is no respecter of person. In Romans, the second chapter, verse 11, Paul writes, for there is no partiality with God. God is no respecter of persons. I'll tell you, half the church don't believe that. Half of, I don't mean this church, but I mean half of Christianity at least does not believe that. Churches have struggled with this. Even churches in the South have struggled with this over the years of their history. Being no respecter of persons. When I got saved, the church was full of being respectful of people. Good Baptist churches, good Methodist churches, good Presbyterian churches. When I was growing up, about the only church that I ever knew that really did not have that principle, but they had poor theology, were the Catholics. Catholics were wide open with this principle. They're about the only ones that I knew personally. God is no respecter of persons. Romans, the second chapter, verse 11. And when you go to Romans... If you go to look that up, and some of you do, you should study the whole context, which is verses 1 through 11. It's well worth the read. But here is that in Deuteronomy 10, 17. Listen to what Deuteronomy 10, 17 says. Here's what it says. It says, for the Lord your God is the God of gods, with a little g, and the Lord, with a capital L, of lords, with a little l, and the great and the mighty and the awesome God who does not show partiality, no respecter of persons, nor does he take bribes. You ought to remember that next time you try to work a deal with him through your prayer life. So you say, well, I don't think I bribe him. Oh, yeah, come on, come on. Oh, God. You'll just... Well, you know, they don't take bribes either. Shows no partiality. You can't bribe them. Oh, God, if you'll just do this, I'll do that. That lasts about a half a second. <laughs> do you know what's really interesting about this? There are nine characteristics mentioned of God. And some of them compared. Nine. He's called the God of gods, the Lord of lords. We're familiar with that. The great, the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality, nor does he take a bribe. Partiality, what it means here, God is no respecter of persons. And listen, we... We in God in Christ are not to be respecter of persons. I was at camp many years ago, Southeastern Youth Camp. A person came to camp that wasn't the Norman standard of camp. didn't have a reservation, wanted to be at camp, had no place to stay, had enough money to get to camp, not enough to get back. What we're going to do with them? Got no place to put them, got nothing to do. What we're going to do with them? Well, let's send them home. Let's, let's, we got no place to put them. He shouldn't be here. How is that possible? He is here. What do you mean he shouldn't be here? Stop, stop asking yourself stupid questions. Is he here? Listen, you know how, how hard it is? We worked all year long to fill the camp with people. God brings people and we don't want them to stay. How is that possible? So they said, well, let's raise enough money among our group and send them home. 
Why would he send them home when God sent them to us? He came to go to camp. Well, they had no place to put them. So what are we going to do? What would you have done with them? Could have, there's a couple options. So I stood back and I listened to all this. You could call somebody and let them stay with them. Is that an option? I'm not saying you would. I'm saying is that, a possi is that an option? Well, I'm just putting things on a piece of paper. Come on. We could fix it comfortable in his car. Right? Who hasn't slept in your car? Bill, you ever slept in your car? Me too. <laughs> That's not what sleeping is, it? I used to drive in Michigan. I pulled off the side of the road and slept a lot of times going to Michigan. I was all by myself. Jane ain't going to pull across. <laughs> that ain't going to happen with Jane. We're going to find a hotel and drive her through. But I was sleeping on the side of the road. And I understand that, but I didn't care. So we, got, we, and so we laid down some options. Take them home. We could do this. We, we could, listen, if we're going to chip in and send them home, why don't we check them, chip in and get them a room? Right? Let's take care of one thing and let, let's just take care of what's what. So let's get them a room. Let's make him feel comfortable, whatever it is. Let's either take them home or let's get him a room. If he needs money for gas, we'll fill his truck up. We'll put him in a room and let him come to camp all week. Then we'll face the second one when we get there. Well, we don't have any money to get him a room. We don't look how much that would cost. I'm going to tell you what God did with my heart that day. He put in my heart be no respecter of persons. And the second thing he put in my heart was that passage about when you went out and visited those in prison and those in the hospital and all that, did you not do it unto me? Remember that? That's what he put in there. And the Holy Spirit of God put in my heart. He said, Ron, I want you to look him right in the eye and see Jesus. I want you to look him right in the eye and see Jesus. And I want you to do that until you see Jesus. And when you see Jesus, take care of him as you would take care of Jesus. So I looked at him about as long as I could feel, without feeling uncomfortable. Made a decision within my own heart what I should do with him and did it so that he could attend camp. God didn't drag him in here from halfway across the United States to go to camp, didn't drive him into camp. This kid raised enough money and stayed and slept in the truck and did everything to get there for us to turn around and tell him, go home. That's not, that one not going to happen. But what God taught me is to see Jesus in people that have needs that you can meet. Now, I didn't tell you that story to pat me on the back or try to make, I'm just telling you, be no respecter of persons. Here's what I'm saying to you. When you get that principle in your soul as a divine viewpoint, he's going to challenge you right away with it. <laughs> oh, yeah, he is. Big talker. Big talker. Let's see, a big walker. He's going to challenge you with it. So be prepared when you buy into this doctrine. God is no respecter of persons, and he wants that principle in your soul. Be sure. You know, I, I remember Tony telling a great story about late in the evening pulling through a, a Jack's hamburger. And the guy wanting... The typical stuff. You know, got a dollar, whatever. And he's just going to do a, a quickie get rid of him. And so he, 
going to do just whatever it took to get rid of this guy out of his hair, get in there, have a hamburger, get back on the road and do what he had to do late in the evening. So he tried to do that, and God wouldn't let him do it. He would, let, would not let him go through that drive through pick up something, leave without doing a circle, and come back to the guy. You know why? He said, look, I want to have an exercise, and there'll be no respecter of person. I want you to see Christ, and everybody has a need that you can meet. Now, I know you've probably had these stories. If you don't, you soon will. <laughs> you're, not going to, you're not going to bypass this lesson. Is that pretty close to the story? Tony? Yeah, that's a pretty close story. But because when I heard it, I thought, hmm, apparently he's running, the, he's, he's, he's running the deal throughout my people, just like he was doing with me. And I know you've had that. If you have it, you will. In our, in, in our lesson, first, God is no respecter of person. Listen to Peter. God had to teach Peter this in Acts 10. Now, Peter came under the power ministry of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. And he is struggling with the old man thinking. From chapter 2 to chapter 10, he's still struggling with giving up the old way of thinking and buying into the new way of thinking. Because in chapter 10 and 11, he meets a guy, a Roman called Cornelius, who was a respected Roman in the Jewish faith. And you know the story how Peter saw a vision, a sheet came down, and God told him to rise up and kill and eat anything, eat the unclean. And Peter went, ah, this is a trick question. You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm a good Jew. He said there are no such thing as good Jews anymore. It's no longer are you a Jew. It's now are you saved. Is Christ is your, is your Savior and your Lord. It's not about, listen, the Jew thing is over. You do know the Jew thing is over, don't you, in the church age? Well, then you better read Galatians 3rd chapter, verse 27, 28. Because there's no, in Christ, we are all one. We are neither Jew nor Gentile. We are neither slave or free. We are neither male nor female. All that stuff, all that stuff that divides us is out. We are one in Christ. He t says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 12, chapter, verse 13. The church, we set, we set the standard for the culture. The culture doesn't set the standard for the church. You know what you do when you find people in your church who are illiterate? Who can't read the Bible written on a fourth, fifth grade level? In English? You know what you do? You teach them. You teach them how to read and write. That's what you do as a church. That's what you do. You don't wring your hands, go like, what are we going to do? And, and leave them out in the cold. You meet their need. You take the educated in the church and teach the uneducated how to read and write so that they can fall in love with the Bible you love. That's what you do. You meet their needs because you're no respecter of persons. You meet their needs. When you don't meet, your need, when you don't meet their needs, you are a respecter of persons. Do you understand that? The easiest way to learn this is in the classroom with good settings. Don't make them choke you down to learn this. Here's what Peter said. Open his mouth, Peter said, I most solemnly understand. Now, you ought to circle that word. Because it's taken him all the way from Acts 2 to Acts 10 
to get this principle. It took a, a vision, a sheet, and told to stand God, and he said, God, and God tells him to rise up and kill this, and he, he says, oh, and I'm not going to, and he says, oh, yes, you are, because we're not under the old covenant anymore. You, my son, Jesus Christ, changed the, co the covenants. We are under the new covenant, and under the new covenant, there's no more respect or prayer. There's no unclean, nothing clean, none of that stuff, and what, what was God trying to tell him? Cornelius. He had a viewpoint of Cornelius that had to go. He wasn't able to meet Cornelius' need because he didn't feel he had a responsibility. When you have a person that wants God and wants Christ and they have a need that you can meet, you do that for Christ's sake. Peter said, I most solemnly understand now. What does it mean now? He had to give up his legalistic Jewish viewpoint of people. Now, that God is not one to show partiality. God is no respective person. Listen, God will rub your nose in it. He did Peter, and he did Ron Adama, and I know he did Butler. He rubbed his nose in it. He'll rub yours in it. The best way to learn it is just cycle it from the left lobe to the right lobe and get it done. Take it from the mind to the heart and let the heart dictate to you the proper manner of behavior. New man, divine viewpoint thinking, we call it. I most certainly, isn't that an interesting word? Certainly. That's because he rubbed his nose in it. Good. He had a nosebleed. I most certainly understand now that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, the man who reverence him does what is right as welcomed in Christ. He talked about the conversion of Cornelius, the Gentile. In verse 28 of chapter 10, and again in chapter 11, 9 and 10, he said to them, the congregation of Jews, you yourself know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with foreigners or to visit him. Where did he get that idea? When the Old Testament in Deuteronomy clearly speaks that God's no respecter of person, right? Where did he get this idea? You know where he got it? The Judaizers, the apostate Jewish teachers of legalism. Because Deuteronomy didn't teach that. And he talks as if it was straight right out of the Old Testament Bible. It's not. It's out of the tradition. It was out of the tradition of the elders' handbook, like in Mark, the seventh chapter. In Mark, the seventh chapter, verses 8 through 13, is where this idea is coming from. Apostate thinking. He said to them, you yourself know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with foreigners or to visit him, yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. I should not be a respecter of persons. We used to call it looking down your nose on others. And what happens? Your nose grows longer, Pinocchio. Therefore, if God give them, the, talking about Gentiles and Jews, if God gave them, the Gentiles, the same gift as he gave us at Pentecost, the Jews, after believing the gospel in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should stand in God's way? See, it's possible as a respecter of person, you stand in God's way. You become a hindrance. Get behind me. What, you know, with Peter, get behind me. You're a hindrance. You're a hindrance to me. When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Do you know that when you study Acts 21 through 26, James and Peter are still struggling? Do you realize they're still struggling? And so is Paul. 
with this idea? What's that teach you? It teaches you how difficult it is to give up old man divine viewpoint thinking once it's developed in your heart and to switch over to new man divine viewpoint thinking when, even when you know in your mind that it's not right. Uh, be well for you to, yeah, be well for you to look at the journey these people made from Acts 2 to the end of the book of Acts and not be so discouraged in your own life. Get back up on your feet and keep slugging it out. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the second point. Because God is no respecter of persons, he treats all unbelievers the same way. Now, you wouldn't believe it in most churches. Boy, if you commit certain kind of sins, you're cooked. You know why God treats all unbelievers the same way? <clears throat> because we're an Adam. Every unbeliever in the whole wide world, I don't care what his culture is, genes or whatever it is, there is, un, is in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 on your paper, <clears throat> we're all dead in Adam, we're all made alive in Christ. <clears throat> it's positional. You know, we talk about positional sanctification for a believer. It's positional. Every unbeliever in Adam, that's a positional truth, just like in Christ is a positional truth. And God treats every unbeliever the same way because everybody is dead in Adam. See, the church has got the idea if people live good moral lives and somehow morality is, a, is, a, is favored in the eyes of God uh, over those who are... Uh, are depraved. <laughs> because somehow behavior, the behavior of an unbeliever, somehow has merit with God. It has no merit with God. God treats all unbelievers the same way. They are, they are under 13 judicial charges in Adam, and the only way out is Jesus Christ. I mean, I can't tell you how many people, if you talk to enough people about salvation of Christ, they'll say, well, I believe I'm going to heaven because I, li I live a, a good life. I'm a, I'm a good moral person. I don't treat bad people badly. I don't do this. I don't do that. <clears throat> are you prepared, I say to them, when they give me that gobble gook? I say to them, are you pre prepared to, to die on a cross, a crucifixion for the sins of ev everybody else in the world? For example, I said, are you willing to go and die on the cross for all the prisoners on death row in America? Every person on death row who has gone through a jury and convicted of the most hideous crime, are you willing to go to the cross and die for him a cruel, terrible death to release them from prison? Who in their right mind would ever consent to do that? But the Lord Jesus Christ, because it was God's will, that died for just a good man. There's no, there's no difference between a good unbeliever and a bad unbeliever. In Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. Those are positional. Listen, if you're in Adam, you're alienated. You're blind, you're cursed, you're condemned, you're at enmity, you're perishing, you're a natural man, you're a sinner, you're unrighteous, you're ungodly, and you're under the raft of God. Because you're an Adam, now has nothing to do with behavior. It has nothing to do with morality or ethics. That's why all people need to be saved, whether they're good, whether they're honorable or not. Christ died for the worst of our community, as well as the best. And they all come the same way. There's not another route. You want to get to God, you have to go through Christ. I am the way, the truth, and, and the life. No man comes unto the Father, John 14, 6. That dear aunt you got that's lived this 
wonderful life. If she doesn't believe that Jesus died for her sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and she dies, she goes to hell. Why wouldn't you go talk to her on her deathbed? She's not going to go because she lives some kind of moral life, went to church a couple of times a week, or, 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 or once a week, or twice a year, or whatever. It took Christ on the cross, dying a cruel death for everybody, the worst of society and the best of society, all in Adam. And the only way out of Adam is Colossians 1.13. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and I mean this for everybody everywhere in the whole wide world, when you believe it, Jesus Christ reaches over into Adam and rescues you, from the domain of darkness and transfers you, transfers you into the kingdom of the beloved son. He removes you from a position in Adam which you could never remove yourself from and puts you into Christ where you could never get apart from grace. You think we don't have a message for the world? And let me tell you, this week he's going to drag people into your six feet of space. It's going to make you uncomfortable who are in your space because they need the message of Christ and grace. Pay attention to your six feet this week. And remember this, you are not to be a respecter of persons. Therefore, just as through one man Adam sinned into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned in Adam. John 5, 24, truly, truly, that's one of them I like because it says truly, truly. I like those. Truly, truly, I say to you, in other words, he said, boy, if you want to memorize a verse, you want to memorize some verses, pick out the ones that say truly, truly, I say unto you. Start there. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. Watch this, but it's passed out. We, t we pay attention to people who've been passed out, don't we? <laughs> That's a 911, isn't it? That have passed out of death, who have passed out of death into life. You know how they passed? Grace. They didn't earn it, they didn't deserve it. And listen, once you're passed out of death into life, you can't ever go back to death. You know, well, listen, when the physical door, when you are at the physical door of death, you don't go from death to life. You go from life to life. Death is nothing for the Christian. It is absolutely nothing. Unless he's in reversionism, then it can be tough but it's still from life to life. It's still life to life, even though it may be a struggle, a little bit of struggle in there. The Bible says it's like a man being drug out of a burning house on fire and rescued. A reversion is dying. It doesn't have to be that way. You can confess your sins. And, but listen, for everybody else, it's a, it's a passage of wonder. Never fear dying. And when you think that time has come, be sure that your passage is going to be in a good state. Confess your sins. Be sure you're in good, a good place. And watch Watch the glory of moving from eternal life to eternal life because it's going to be the greatest experience you've ever had in this life. That's what Paul told you. In 2 Corinthians 12 chapter, that's what, exactly what he told you. It was so exciting that he was told he must never repeat it. You must never talk about that part of it.
Here's my final point in the morning. Because God is no respecter of person, he treats all believers in Christ the same way. He's no respecter of person in Adam, and he's no respecter of persons in Christ. That's a wonderful thing. See, we got some crazy feeling. We think he treats some believers, unbelievers, and, he, and we think the same way about believers. In, that, in Christ, he treats everybody alike. It's called positional truth. It's called positional truth. He treats all believers in Christ without partiality. We study those in the 50 things you receive at the point of salvation. You can never lose in time and eternity. Paul talks about it when he says, in Adam you die, but in Christ all are made alive. All are dead in Adam. All are alive in Christ. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 12. God has respect for the redemptive work of his son, Jesus Christ, so that he says, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place, heaven, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews 10, 14, by one offering he has perfected, completed, Telio, oh, perfect tense. For all time, those who are sanctified. Positional. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In him, Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Listen, which he lavishes upon us. <laughs> lavishes. That's a good word in it. Who doesn't like to be lavished? I mean, that's treated way above. I mean, lavish means that it's treated so far above that you feel like a queen for the day. You feel like the man of the hour. That's lavished. Pampered or however you want to look at it. And finally, there is neither Jew nor Greek, Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ. I'm going to tell you a great book to read on partiality. The whole book is dedicated to this subject. You with me? Write this book down. Now, you, you're never going to do this. You're never going to do what I tell you, tell you because it's too big. So you're not going to do it, but I'm going, to, I'm going to throw it out there anyhow because if one out of a hundred does it, it'll bless your life. You with me? You got your pen? Well, take your pocket knife out. Write this down. The book of Luke. The book of Luke. It is the greatest book of all of them on this idea of show no partiality. Let me give you just a few places. Let me tease you to read the book. Let me tease you. The 10th chapter, the story of the Good Samaritan. Chapter 15, the prodigal sons. Pay attention to both the sons. Chapter 11. Pay attention to pharisaical legalism and what they attack. Chapter 16, Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus and the rich man. Chapter 19, I'm just, I just hit a few. I'm just teasing you to read the book. I just jumped all over the book and grabbed things that you would know. I mean, you know these stories, right? Pay attention, be no respect to a person in them. Here's 19. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Right? Zacchaeus, 19th chapter, verses 1 through 10. What a wonderful verse, verse 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The whole book is dedicated to this subject. 
dedicated to our subject. And the underline of, of that book, in the underline of that book is this idea, be no respecter of person. Now, all of them are going to have some of it. Luke is loaded. Luke is loaded. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this study. Be no respecter of persons. That's the character of God that he wants in the character of the believer. And it's, 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 it's a simple concept that seems to be very difficult because sometimes we get really uncomfortable with, with the character of people. Somehow we, we judge people with e evil motive, as James says, that he was guilty of and his congregation. I pray, Father, for us to be good stewards of this in the application of our life to all, towards other people. Take our filters off. Quit judging people whether we should let them in our space or not. Let God judge it. Let God judge it. I'm thankful for that in my own life with Christ. He didn't judge me based on who I was in my own personal life. He judged me on who I was in Adam. I thank you for that. I pray that upon our church in Jesus' name. Amen.